What's up guys, it's Jay from Talkative. In today's video, we're going to make a pet hatching system similar to the one you've seen in Pet Simulator X. You will learn how to use viewport frames, tweens, and remote functions to build this awesome system. So let's get started. Before we begin programming, you guys need to get the UI element required to make this hatching system work as well as the build. Both of them are linked as models in the description for you to download 100% for free and use in your games. To make this tutorial more focused on programming, I'm going to skip the part of creating that, but if you guys have any questions on modifying it or creating your own version, just leave them in the comments below. So the first thing we're going to do to make our hatching system work is create a currency system so that users can easily buy the eggs that they want. We're not going to do anything too advanced, we're just going to use leader stats. The first thing we're going to do is create a script and service script service that we're going to name leader stats service. This script will manage everything related to leader stats, so for this case, it'll just be the amount of cash that the player has. We're going to create a function called player added. This will be called whenever a new player joins the game. So anything you put in this code will fire when a new player joins the game. So we could write something like print player player.name has joined and it would print their name whenever they join. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a folder called leader stats like so and just set its name to leader stats as we said. It has to be named leader stats. If you don't name it leader stats, it'll actually not show on the leaderboard for the other players in the game. From there, we're going to create the proper value that we want to put in it. We're going to create a cash value, which will be an integer value since you're not going to have decimal amounts of cash. So instance.new int value, which means integer value. And then we're gonna set the name of this to cash. Whatever you set the name of this value to will be how it appears on the leaderboard for the other users. Finally, we'll set the parent of this cash to the leader stats folder, and then the leader stats folder parent to the player that we wanna put inside of. Finally, we just need to add an event connection. This will basically tell the computer that we want to fire player added whenever a player is added to the game. This is really simple. Just do game.players.playerAdded and connect to that event with a function that will be player added. This identifies the name of the function, fires it, and automatically sends the parameters that are provided in player added, which in this case is just the player that is added. Now you'll notice that when we join the game, we're gonna have a folder called cash right here that shows how much money we have. And you can see that we set it right here, set as leader stats, cash. If I change the value, It'll change right here for them. The next thing we're gonna create is an interaction listener. Basically, the egg hatching system relies on proximity prompts. We wanna create one easy script that's able to manage all of these interactions, allowing you to run multiple hatching systems throughout your game. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create a script inside of starter player scripts. We'll make it a local script since we only want it to run on that player's client. Let's call this interaction listener. So in order for this to work, we need to first access our, all of our eggs. To do that, we're gonna reference egg platforms. So let's set up a folder section of our code with comments and say local egg platforms equals workspace, wait for child, egg platforms. After that, we wanna loop through all of the egg platforms and look for their proximity prompts, which are found under the platform part right here. So what we'll do is use a for loop for underscore platform Actually, we'll use for underscore egg in pairs, egg platforms, get children, do, do. What this code basically does is it turns all of the children of this egg platforms folder into a table and loops the table. The underscore is equivalent to the index of the table while egg is the value, meaning in this case, it only loops through once. And at one point, this underscore is equal to one and egg is equal to the part or the model basic egg. Now that we're able to access all of our platforms, we simply want to add an event handler for when the proximity prompt is tr triggered. So let's just do egg.platform pl dot proximity prompt dot triggered, meaning with, when they interact with it, connect function. So now that we have a new function, we need to make it fire the egg hatching animation. Now you'll notice that we don't really have one yet. So what do we do? In order for this to work, we're gonna create another script inside of the interaction listener. We're gonna use a module script. The reason we'll do that is we wanna call the code inside of this module script from the interaction listener. It's pretty simple. We're gonna name our module script eggutils since it'll handle everything related to the animations. 
From there, let's rewrite this to say local egg utils equals empty table return egg utils. This just makes it a little bit easier to read the code for someone who might not have written it. Now, the first thing we need to do is assign a few variables. First, we want a folder called pet models. This will be located under replicated storage. So just create a new folder and name it pet folders. We also need to grab some services in order to access that. So let's grab local players, which is game get service players lighting tween service for our animating and finally replicated storage to access our folders we've created next up we want to identify the folders that we created so let's just do local pet models equals replicated storage wait for child pet models and i actually noticed i made a little spelling mistake here let's call this pet models there's a few more things we want to get. We need to get some of the user interface elements because a lot of this runs off the client's UI. So let's get the player, which is the local player, meaning you're talking to the client. And let's grab their current UI, which is player GUI equals player, wait for child, player GUI. The next thing we want to do is identify a folder called game UI. This will be the screen GUI that holds all of our frames. I've already created it, but all you have to do is go into starter GUI, create a new screen GUI and name it game UI like this. Finally, we need to get the hatch frame. Because we're gonna be cloning it for every animation, we're actually gonna keep it in replicated storage and access it using wait for child. We'll clone this every time a new instance of the animation is run. The last thing we need is a lighting effect. When the animation begins, we actually blur the player's screen. To do that, we create a lighting effect and we just call it blur. From there, we go local blur equals lighting, wait for child, blur effect. So after a brief uh, two to three month break from recording this video for some reason, uh, we're back in the middle of the tutorial. And as I look back, I notice that I made a little mistake. Basically, uh, this right here is named blur, but this is asking for blur effect. So <clears throat> we're just gonna go into the code right here and switch that to say blur. Everything else is exactly where we left it. And we're gonna get back to work on writing our pet hatching system. I very much apologize for the delay in this video, but it's here finally. And uh, happy new year, hoping to make some consistent content. Let's get back to work. Now that we've set all of our variables, it's time to actually write the animation and start creating some of our functions. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create a function in egg utils called hatch egg. It'll get the egg model and the name of the pet that the player unlocked. From there, we're gonna create a function called get pet model. This will return a model of the pet that you give as long as the name is accurate. So all it, will, all it will do is return pet models, find first child pet name. Now, in order for our egg util animation to work, we first want to get that model. So let's do local pet model equals get pet model pet name. We then want to enable the blur by setting it to true. This will blur the player's screen. From there, we're going to clone our hatch frame like I said we would. And we are going to access some more variables just to make it a little bit easier to write our animations. The first thing we want is the viewport, which is frame.viewport frame. The viewport frame will be used to show a physical image of the egg in the pet that the player unlocks. Finally, we're gonna set the parent of the frame to the player's game UI. This will actually make it visible for them. Now, in order for a viewport frame to work, it needs to have a camera so that it knows where to look inside of the game and the objects within it. We're gonna create a new camera every time. So let's do local camera equals instance.new camera. We're going to set the parent of it to viewport and then we are going to set the viewport frame's current camera meaning the lens that it will look through to this camera we've created. What we're going to do next is we need to actually clone our egg model and put it in the viewport. That will allow it to be rendered and then the user can see the egg that they hatch. So to do that we're going to make a new egg which is a clone of our egg model that we got and then we're going to set the parent of this to the viewport and we're going to set the C frame to C frame dot look at i'll explain this in a second vector 3.new 0 0 0 camera dot c frame 
desktop position. So the look at C frame basically takes in two arguments. The first being the actual position of the argue of the object. In this case, it's the origin zero, zero, zero. The second spot, the second spot is what the object is actually looking at. In this case, we want it to look directly at the camera. So it's facing the front for the computer or for the user to see it. So I just said to the C frame position of our camera. Next up, to change our zoom, we're gonna set the field of view to be 10, which is about just as zoomed in as you want it to be and as it can be. The next thing we need to do is tween our camera field of view. This is a trick to zoom the model in or out without actually having to change its position. So let's tween our camera field of view. Comments are really useful just to kind of divide up your code a little bit. And we're gonna create our tween out, which is tween service, create. I like to divide my tweens over multiple lines like this because I think it looks cleaner. The object we're gonna use is the camera. Our tween info object, all it needs is two because it's gonna be linear. And we basically wanna increase our field of view just a little bit to 15, which will make the appearance of it zooming out. Now we're gonna play our tween out, something like that. And we're gonna wait for it to complete, connected to the completed event. And no code will fire until this two second tween is over. When it's over, we're gonna to switch to the pet model. So we're gonna take the new pet model that we want, which is a clone of the pet model we got up here in the beginning. And we are going to destroy the egg, just kind of clean things up a little bit before we put our new one in, and set the pet model's primary part C frame to exactly what we created up here. Now, the reason we're using this primary part C frame is that the pet is a model, not a single part. So we have to identify its primary part, which is usually like the center object. We're gonna set the parent to the viewport just like we did with the egg and then we're good to go when the pet gets revealed we want to do a little bit of a like a pop animation we want it to kind of be exciting you know the user is getting something new so we're going to create local pop tween in new tween service our instance will once again be the camera and we'll use tween info again to create a half second tween which will be elastic this will create that kind of bouncy effect finally we're going to rezoom it in to a field of view of 10 back from 15. now before this pop goes in we want to set the text at the top to tell you what pet you got so this all fires at the same time so let's set up our text let's take the pet name dot text and set the string dot format like this so this basically means Whatever is here in this percentage sign S will be formatted to whatever I put right here, which in this case is the string of the user's pet name. So let's say we had a pet name of dog. It would actually return dog like this. It just removes this percentage S and replaces it with this argument. Now we're gonna set the size of our pet name to be item two dot from scale zero, zero, which means it's invisible. So you might be wondering, why would we do that? Why even create this in the first place? That's because we're gonna tween it in, make it look all fancy and cool. We're gonna set the visibility to true so we don't have to worry about that later on because the user won't be able to see it. And then we're gonna create our pop text in tween like such. No, we don't want false. Uh, we're gonna take the pet name that we just ed created and edited, tuneinfo.new, the exact same length as the other one. Now, I already got this uh, size in advance when I designed the UI, but it's basically the original size that we created or that the UI was when we created it. So let's do UDM2 up from scale 0 0.264, 0 0.052. That is a percentage of the hatch frame. So this is 26.4% of the total width of our UI. Now we wanna play both of those tweens at the same time. So pop tween in, play, pop text in, play. Both of those will fire at the exact same time, looking pretty cool. And before we do anything else, we want to wait for those two to complete. So wait about a half second for just either one of those tweens to complete. Use our wait or completed event. And what we're gonna do next is we're gonna have some text appear that says click to continue. They can click anywhere on the screen and this will basically just close the UI. So frame, dot click to continue dot visible equals true. Now the next thing we're gonna do is set up a connection to an input began event. One of the most important things to know about connections is that if you create one and don't need it anymore, you want to disconnect it to prevent the computer from using excess memory. So the way we'll do that is saying local connection. We need to set nothing to it in the beginning so that can be accessible within itself. It's a little weird. It looks a little ugly, I know. There are other ways to do it in more advanced ways. I personally use an entirely different method, but that's not something to share in this video. Uh, but now we will connect to the connection. Connection equals frame 
input begin connect function input now this basically will just be any input whatsoever so we want to kind of file down which one will be specifically a left click so if the input type is equal to mouse button one enums basically prevent you from putting in anything that essentially wouldn't exist it just kind of is an easier way to prevent error then we will hide our blur destroy our frame and remove and disconnect this event because it's not going to be needed anymore so let's do connection disconnect and boom everything is very nice and completed if you want to do some extra memory management you can actually pop tween in destroy you can do pop text in destroy and you can do tween out destroy. This is just a little way to prevent the computer from allocating any memory left over for these tweens. It's a pretty negligible difference, but some people like to micro optimize things. So I'll put that in for you guys. The next big thing we have to do is set up our pet service on the server to prevent the users from basically hacking their own pets in. So let's go ahead and do that by creating a new script. We're going to call it pet service. And this is going to be a pretty simple script. It's going to have a service at the top, which will be replicated storage because we need to access a remote function, which I'll explain a little bit more about in a sec. Sweet. And now for the next part of what we need, we're going to use another module. Again, I do have a video on module scripts. Check out our channel. It'll also be linked at the card on the top right about now. So if you go to modules, we're going to create one under pet service like this right here. And we are going to call it egg data. This will basically contain the pets each egg contains. Now I'm going to write this module a little differently than the one before. As you can see here, I created a variable for the table at the top, added things to it later and returned the module. We're going to do something a little bit different though. So we're just going to return the in table right away and put our data in. So the only egg we have right now is the basic egg, which is going to have the raccoon in it. Now, the raccoon isn't currently in my game. I'm going to copy it over right now. Again, it is available as part of the free models. And we are just going to paste it in using Control Shift V. And now it's here. So if we use the get pet model function that we made in the client, you'll be able to access it. This will make a little bit more sense as we move forward in the tutorial. So we have that created. Let's go back to our pet service and let's create a reference to that module. So local egg data equals require script wait for child egg data now remember we're using require to get the data in the script not a direct reference to the script itself let's then get our remote functions folder which we have not made yet basically we're going to create a folder called remote functions so let's grab another folder let's name it remote functions and let's create a remote function so remote functions are basically just like normal functions but the client can actually call it and it will retrieve data from the server and return it back to them. The reason you use this is if a user is trying to make a purchase and they say, oh, I have a million dollars, give me this item, and you don't check it on the server to see that they actually have zero dollars, your game is gonna get hacked and it's gonna get hacked a lot. So we have our remote function created. We're gonna give it a name so it's easier to reference. We'll call it hatch egg since it'll be called and return the egg that the player unlocks. We'll create a reference to our remote functions folder, which is in replicated storage, wait for child remote functions. Now, if you were to add more pets inside of your egg, you would want to randomly select one of them. And the way we're gonna do this is first creating the random object. Just like this, we can use this right here to access a bunch of functions. We're only gonna be using one in this video. I'll explain it in a sec. Now, when the user invokes the remote function like this, hatch egg, dot on server invoke equals function player egg. So basically what this means is on the client, if someone references this hatch egg function and calls invoke server, that will fire this and whatever I return here, right? If I return hi, will actually be returned to the client to use. And you can also run code up here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our egg data. We're gonna grab an egg from there it being basic egg right now, usually. And then we wanna choose a random one. So we're going to use next integer, one length of egg data egg. Now, this just looks weird and confusing, I know. Let's break it down. Next integer chooses a random number inclusively between this number and this one. It is an integer though. 
So if this was one and this was three, it would either choose one, two, or three randomly. This little hashtag basically means the length of a table. Egg data, egg is basically referencing egg data if we use basic egg here and the length of this table, which is one. So it's between one and one inclusive, which means this will always be one until you add more pets. But this isn't really secure. I mean, you could just fire this without ever really doing anything on the server. We are going to add a pretty simple server sided check to see if the user actually can afford the egg or not. Now, in order for this to work, we need to grab a few services, modules and folders, but it'll all be pretty simple. We'll walk you through it. So let's grab replicated storage. The reason we're grabbing this is we need to invoke that event. We do have a video on using remote events, which are pretty similar and you can learn more about networking, which will be linked in the card on the top right about now. We also want to get the remote functions folder from there. So let's do remote functions equals replicated storage, wait for child remote functions. We've got that. And the final thing we're going to make is a little variable called is hatching, which we will set to false. This basically means is the player hatching an egg. The first thing we need to see is if not is hatching, then this means if is hatching equals false, the not basically negates the value. If not is hatching looks a little confusing, but is the exact same as saying if is hatching equals false, then but you typically don't want to have this if equals false. It's just a stylistic thing. It's easy to do if not is hatching. So we'll set is hatching to true so that they can't trigger it again until everything is done. And then we will get our pet name randomly. We'll do that by saying local pet name equals remote functions dot hatch egg invoke server egg dot name. What this will do is it'll fire this code on the server that we created under pet service and whatever is returned from here will be used within our interaction listener. So the egg name we're providing is basic egg, which will then reference basic egg here and grab a random string here being raccoon, meaning pet name is equal to raccoon. Now we're going to add a simple check. If pet name, then this basically means if it returned anything. Let's say something broke and it just gave nothing. We would want to check for that not to happen. Otherwise it would give your code an error. It's really good to add small checks like these just to keep your code running smoother. Now we need to get our egg utils module. Under services, we'll create modules and we're going to reference egg utils. Let's require script wait for child egg utils. Now if the pet name exists, we'll do egg utils hatch egg egg dot egg model with the pet name. Remember, those are the two arguments we need to provide in order for this to work, especially with the get pet model function. Finally, when that's all over, we will do is hatching equals false. Now you may be wondering, how would this work? I mean, where is the wait? When does it wait for any of this to work? Well, egg utils hatch egg, if you guys remember, has weights within it. The code Outside of this, we'll wait for all of those to fire and we'll not fire the next line of code here until these waits are completed. This is because they're running on the same thread. It's not diverting the work anywhere else. The explanation of all that is for another time, but just know that the waits in here will persist outside of the script into here. So is hatching will be false. And with that, our beautiful game should work. So I tested it and I made a typo. We all do that. A lot of my errors are usually typos. The issue is in egg utils line 15. And I wrote way for child, not wait for child. Nice job. Make sure that your blur is disabled by unchecking this enabled box. Now, if we go play to test it, we should have everything fully working. I made one more mistake. When I copied this, I forgot to include cframe.lookat. Here, I was trying to give it a vector three. So it was incompatible, which is very bad. So now we've changed it. It returns a C frame. Everything is all well and good. It'll set the positions properly and we won't get that error again. So here we go. So we made one more issue. Wow, we made a lot of issues. I have not worked with this code in three months. So I kind of pushed through it a little bit too quickly, but I use enum.user input when it's actually enum.user input type dot mouse button one like that. Now we should be good to go. Let's play it. And this is our final working version for your pet hatching system. 
We hatch. <gasps> what do we get? We get a raccoon. Click anywhere to continue. We go. It works again. Look at that. It's beautiful. All working. And just like that, you guys have created a pet hatching system. Now, if you guys want to continue to make cool things with it, I would take your pet service right here and I would actually put the pet in their inventory. I would check that they have money on the server. And then I would subtract money. So something you might want to do is give each egg a price. So you could set this to have a price value and a pets folder like that. But if you guys have any specific questions about that, ask in the comments. I'll give some more specific tips. This was more on how to make the animated side of it with a little bit of introduction on the server, but I didn't want to overwhelm everyone. Thank you guys very much for watching this tutorial. Again, I'm super sorry for the super large delay. Hoping to get weekly videos out. It is a little bit tough. And I'm also very new to teaching scripting. I'm sure that I might have made some things overcomplicated. Might have made some dumb mistakes. Just some dumb things. So if you need any clarifying questions whatsoever, ask in the comments. I'll respond super lightning fast for you guys. And uh, have fun. Go make millions of Robux with your own pet simulator. Have a great day. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Goodbye.